So I want to start off by bringing our first uh, speaker, and that is Mr. Doug Bush from Cultured Abalone. Doug? Thanks very much. My name's Doug. I'm the general manager and partner of the Cultured Abalone Farm, uh, located on Dos Pueblos Ranch, just west of Goleta, classic Gaviota coastline. Uh, we've been in operation in some form or another uh, and, and here I'm including the, the, the nucleus the, the, of the idea, the, the classic California start a business in your garage, proof of concept, find any bucket, put salt water in it, and, and, and go from there. Uh, since mid-80s, uh, right through to today. Uh, back in the 80s, there were a great number of entrepreneurs starting abalone farms when some of the methods were originally worked out on, on how to go about spawning them, doing the hatchery work. And uh, since that time, it's, it's winnowed away. And, and now there are about, about six uh, operators in the state of California growing, <clears throat> in most cases, red abalone, one of the largest spe growing species of abalone in the world and native to the central California coast. I'm going to talk a little bit this evening about abalone and seaweed. Uh, these, are, these are some little babies that we have just outside of our hatchery. Uh, these squares, that's the back of a tile, and that, those are one inch squares. So these are abalone that are in the neighborhood of a quarter inch to a, to a half inch in size. This is our farm, this is our hatchery in the foreground. Uh, uh, railroad trestle in the background, we're, we're nestled in a little valley. You wouldn't know we were there unless you knew to look for us. Uh, the tanks grow underneath shade cloth. Abalone don't like light too much. They're, they're, they're shy creatures, they feed in the in the, in the evening hours and in the day, they, they find a rock to crawl under. So we try to simulate their natural environment as much as possible, give them a nice, cool, stable, dark, shaded area to grow in. So this is our farm, and you can see here, this is our pipeline that, that goes out. We pump seawater 24-7 from about 1,600 feet offshore. Our intake is in about 40 feet of depth. Usually this time of year, uh, the surface water is pretty warm. Uh, 65, 67, even up to 70 degrees. We generally pump from below a thermocline, uh, cooler water. We do, we do pretty well for year-round conditions. It de doesn't get too warm or too cold for the abalone. We get pretty good growth rates throughout the year. So abalone farming, like any sort of farming, we have sort of, you know, we're required by, by current culinary law to have a, uh, a farm-to-table manifesto. Um, <clears throat> spawning, spawning to hatching takes about a day. Hatching to settlement, that's, uh, that's, that's the larval phase of the, of the abalone in which they're actually swimming freely in the water column. And you'll see some, something in a, in a minute where I show you a bit about that. It takes about a week from settlement to weaning. And by weaning, I mean going from a, a thin film of microalgae, diatoms, onto macroalgae or seaweed. And I'll talk more about that as well. That takes about three to four months. About three years of just keeping them clean and sorted and happy and feeding them kelp and seaweed. Harvesting, purging out their guts, getting them clean and ready for market, takes about three days. Anywhere I can ship it in 24 hours, uh, I, can sell, I can sell live abalone anywhere that I can get it within 24 hours. Uh, shucking, trimming, and pounding, Michael's department, I won't tread on that. Uh, cooking, 30 to 45 seconds. That's the, the eating you know, as, as long as you want. <laughs> linger because it took a long time to get there. The, the crux of the thing is getting a lot of them all at once. With, with, with abalone, you can't go to Home Depot and buy baby abalone. You're, it's incumbent upon the farmer to do the whole thing, to be, to be intimately familiar with the whole cycle and completely integrated with the whole, with the whole production. So getting the abalone, Get, recognizing when, when these, uh, these female abalone are ripe and gravid and full of eggs and ready to produce high quality eggs, same for the males, getting this coordinated, doing this in a controlled way, doing it in a repeatable way, year after year after year, it's, even with the methods being pretty well described, it's, it's very challenging. Uh, you know, this is not exactly a trade secret, but, but uh, you know, with... Uh, with abalone, as with most mollusks, the way to stimulate them is to irritate them. And what we do is we put them in a, in a solution of, of hydrogen peroxide that kind of gets under their you know, mantle a little bit and it kind of sends them down this pathway where they just can't help themselves anymore. 
and you know, and foom, there go the eggs. Foom, there go the sperm. Yeah, they're not for romance, really. <laughs> so these guys aren't very big. Um, these, these abalone that you see here, they're about three and a half inches. Uh, you can see some stripes on the shells. Uh, that's kind of a little bit oh, a, a, an easy way to recognize our abalone in the marketplace. But uh, that comes from the diet, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. But so this is, we put them in these, in these containers, we put the peroxide in there, we rinse them, and then after a while, you can see these are the efferent siphons, and that's, those are our, our sperm cells being emitted into the water. And we'll, we'll mix that up, we'll take a count, get an idea of how many millions upon millions of sperm cell exist in a couple of milliliters of water, and we'll mix that appropriately with our, our bucket full of eggs. So these are, these are the females. Um, typical to, uh, to, to most metaphors, the, uh, the, males, are, the males are easy. It's, it, I only need a couple of those. Um, the females, on the other hand, are, are a lot, they, they need a little bit more negotiation. But a, but a female about this size, three and a half inches, can produce 500,000 to a million eggs in a single shot. I'll typically do about six buckets of four, so like 24 females, and cross that by about eight to 12 individual males. So in any given spawning attempt, I've got somewhere in the neighborhood of between 100 and 200 potential genetic crosses. And the reason that I do that is one, it's a lot easier to work with smaller abalone for the spawning. And the second reason is it helps me build in a lot more genetic diversity into the, in, into the actual on-site production. One of the things that you hear sometimes that in, uh, like for example in the banana industry, is bananas have become hopelessly inbred at this point, and it's becoming a real problem for bananas as we know it. So the more diversity I can build into it, the less, you know, the, the less, I, the less I'm gonna face problems. I can, I, can gain the, I can gain the advantages of selecting my fast growers, my animals that have really nice round shells, good coloration, good color on the skin and foot and pigment, good, good, uh, good meat quantity. And, uh, but yet I'm not, I'm not suffering any sort of inbred consequence. This is a, a trochophore, which is a, 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 a mollusk larvae. You can see it's essentially it's a yolk. And what it has is it has a ring of cilia around it, and then this is a cap of cells. So this is all energy that the, that the larval abalone is gonna be using for development during that first week of life. And the cilia are the mode by which they, they you know, mobilize themselves in the, in the water column. I was kind of stoked to get this one where it's actually, you find it actually pushing its way out of the chorionic envelope in, in you know, right, right there on the, on the microscope slide. So millions of these in, in very clean water in buckets will alternately swim up to the light in the early morning and then relax and then go down and then up again to the light in the evening. And, uh, <clears throat> And over, you know, over the course of the week, that little cap of cells will developmentally progress. They're, they're really zany at this stage. Um, and you can see here, this is the larval shell. It's now, it's now got like a little, looks like a little, uh, like a little cap, like a little beanie. Uh, and it still has the cilia on the other side. And then these are some, some shots of continuing development. Uh, you can see the, the elongation of the, of the shell. Um, the cilia still present there. This is the beginning of the, of the foot. At this point, it looks in some ways just like a, like a garden snail. And the morphology of an abalone, it's just a snail. It's not really that different from a garden snail, except instead of eating your basil, it's, it's, eating, uh, it's, it's eating seaweed. And so it gets to about this stage after a week, and then we, we induce it to settle. And then at this point, we, we, we put some stuff in the water, which makes, it, which makes them all say at the same time, let's stop swimming, let's, let's go to the bottom and our, put our foot down. And one of the things is the, the availability of a, of a diatom, which has a, a high degree of nutrition for these little baby abalone to, to feed on. And that's what this is. This is navicula. You can see these cool little football frisbee-shaped uh, um, algal cells. And what we'll do is we'll culture a, a lawn of this stuff in all of the tanks where we're going to induce these millions of critters to settle and put their foot down and flip their shell over and stop being little swimmy critters and, and start being little crawly critters. And at this stage, the abalone are 
as small as the smallest pencil dot you can make with, a, with the sharpest pencil. They're barely visible. You can see them with the naked eye, but if they're, they're on any sort of a dirty or background, or for example, a background covered in algae, they are completely invisible. So you go into this, this black box phase for about a, week, about a week, where you have no idea whether that was successful or not. And you just sort of go, I, ho I, hope, I hope so. I <laughs> so even, you know, despite all our efforts, there's a, there's a great deal. You, you, you hit stages where, you, where, where uh, you're just crossing your fingers and flying in the fog. So you can actually see here, this is the, the larval shell, and that's the foot. And they're actually crawling along on like a little clump. There's two of them here. And they're actually crawling along post-metamorphosis on a little clump of the navicula paste. So yeah, and oh, and you just saw right there, there's like a little eye spot. So, and at this point, they're essentially abalone. From here all the way up to market size, it's just growth. First they eat, and they just, that, that spiral, which all mollusks share in that, that sort of beautiful Archimedes golden ratio of, of shell development, they just keep laying another ring down, and laying another ring down, laying another ring down, and just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And with abalone, for the most part, they, they keep growing longer, longer than any, any other, the red abalone, more than any other species in the world. And, you know, and uh, as, as, many, as many Santa Barbarans will tell you, some of the abalone that, were, that can still be found uh, up in the far north of the state or out, out at the islands, you know, you, you talk like trophy abalone, I believe the minimum threshold is, is 10 inches. And, you know, you talk to, I've, I've met people who have, you know, a, a couple 11 inches. I mean, those are dinner plate sized abalone. We do not grow those. It would, those, those animals are, would take us an incredibly long time to grow in tanks. What we grow are abalone that are about three, a little over three inches, three and a quarter to three and a half inches in size. Very uniform in size, very, uh, very uniform in color and appearance. And that has a, an obvious uh, uh, ability to be available year round, to be, to be workable for, for, for both professional and home chefs, uh, a certain amount of reproducibility and portion control and, and recipe tailoring to, to what the product is gonna be. So that there on that bottom is, is, a, is, a, is a market size. Up in the upper part of the slide, you can see, I mean, these are stages. They're grown on tiles uh, through larger and larger scales until they're ready for market. So how do they get there? I mean, it's the, 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 one of the things that, that drew me originally to abalone and continues to fascinate me today is, is the nutrition in the feed. Um, I, I, I did a lot of research work uh, when, I was, when I was a graduate student on, on animal nutrition. And I found it fascinating like across the board from, from ruminant nutrition, any bovine ruminant nutritionists in the room? <laughs> uh, I, amazing stuff, really cool stuff from, from them, uh, all, you know, whether you're talking about those or chickens or, or fish or, or shellfish, it's the feed that makes it happen, right? If you talk to a, if you talk to a beef farmer, particularly some of the, the, the guys that are right here in our county that are doing such wonderful product today, in very large sense, they're, they're grass farmers, they're pasture managers as much, if, if, at least as much, if not more than they are uh, actual cow producers and it, you're you're so tied to the food you're so tied to what what this resource is that you're supplying to the abalone that's what makes them what they're going to be and the quality of our product is is very very closely tied to what we feed them we very very proudly we do not feed our abalone and I, I wish this were universally true for cultured abalone around the world but we and everyone in California feeds their abalone exclusively with seaweed. We don't use any pre-prepared commercial like abalone chow. Uh, there are, you know, there are, there are other parts of the world where, uh, where abalone is cultured in tanks and they're fed, fed pellets. And these pellets can contain, you know, non-oceanic uh, non, uh, protein, uh, pro protein ingredients. I guess that's fine. You know, that I, it, I'm not necessarily saying that that's bad, but it's not what we want to do. It doesn't make it an abalone in my mind. If you want it to be an abalone, if you want it to taste like abalone, it should be fed seaweed. And, and beginning to end, whether they're being fed uh, a, a single-celled species right through to the seaweed that we harvest here offshore, they're fed seaweed straight through. This is the backside of the islands, a big kelp bed. And that, that kelp cutter right there, that is not our kelp cutter. Uh, that is the old... Um, Ocean Star, which was operated by Kelco, 
uh, which was the, the alginate-based business that operated out of San Diego. Kelp has been harvested since 19, uh, like 1908. Uh, kelp was originally uh, purified for potash. Uh, one of the original markets for kelp was as was when World War I as a, as a, as a source for potash and subsequent uh, gunpowder. Um, after the after World War One ended, the the bottom fell out uh, on the on the kelp as potash market, and there were people that were harvesting it, were looking for different things to do. Several generations later, it became a purified ingredient. It's found in a lot of, of uh, commercial commercial products, but no longer in California. The only kelp harvesters in California, for the most part, are abalone farmers, and we do it much the same way. We harvest it from about 18 inches below the surface, which is mowing the lawn, taking the tips, and it just keeps the canopy, keeps growing right up below us. We, we harvest up and down the state and our feed travels from as far away as Ventura or Carpinteria or up in Morro Bay to our farm in, uh, in, here in uh, Goleta Gaviota. So minimum amount of carbon miles and, and freeway loading in terms of getting our input to our farm to actually grow the product. Uh, Couple other seaweeds that we grow on site. You guys notice some of those red stripes that exist on our shells that make our abalone so distinctive. This is a this is a, a local red seaweed. Uh, one of the reasons that red abalone are red is because they occur at anywhere from 15, 20 feet down to 40, 50, 60 feet of depth. And the dominant algal species in those depths of water are red are red algae and that the pigments in those red algae accumulate in the, in the shell tissue of the abalone and that's what gives them the red color. If you feed a white abalone or a green abalone on an exclusive diet of red seaweed, they'll be red as well. Similarly, when we're feeding our abalone mostly just kelp, they don't turn red and you get these bands of red from when we're feeding them the red seaweed that we grow on site or little diatom blooms that exist. Uh, another one that we're uh, playing around with as a, as a additive to the diet. Uh, this is Turkish towel or chondrocanthus. The guys up in Monterey Bay, they're growing this on a line. This is something that we're hoping to do here locally, grow some uh, local native California seaweeds on ropes. I've been doing this for thousands of years in China. It's not new. We just don't. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Grassalaria pacifica or ogo. Um, uh, this couple, this Gracilaria is very weird. It's, it takes on a lot of different shapes. It's very difficult to, to identify one species from another. This is a, a species that grows a little bit in the bite and south towards San Diego. Uh, there's another uh, variant of this ogo that grows mo more up in Monterey Bay that we're, we're culturing each of these. They have a, a really wonderful color, very high protein content. The abalone grow very well on them. And some other seaweeds that we're, we're interested in messing around with. And then each of these seaweeds just as food for thought, each of these seaweeds has a commercial application. Every, all the kids in the whole county, they're all eating seaweed snacks. They get them at Trader Joe's, they get them at Costco. Seaweed's not a weird thing to most Californians as, as a potential direct food source anymore. But all of the seaweed that you see people eating in this country is almost universally imported. So we have an opportunity to possibly grow seaweeds here in California. It's extractive. It's low trophic level, it soaks up nutrients, it soaks up carbon dioxide. It would be a real net benefit. So if you ever hear about a public proposal where Doug from the Cultured Abalone wants to ask the, ask the taxpayer permission to grow seaweed in the, in the, in, you know, out, in, out in our ocean waters, come down and tell me what you think and, and uh, you know, see if that's a project that you think the, you know, that people could get behind. Thank you, Doug. Yeah, we're going to do questions maybe afterwards. You could, uh, uh, because we've started a little late, we'll do questions at the very end. So now I'd like to bring up Bernard Friedman from Santa Barbara Mariculture. My name is Bernard. You hear me? <laughs> and I, I operate the, uh, the, the only open ocean uh, farm on the West Coast here. And I grow oysters and mussels. Now I'm just concentrating on mussels, the Mediterranean mussel. And uh, I started about 12, 13 years ago. And uh, I was never really supposed to make it because it's really challenging to grow things in the open ocean. And now that I'm, I'm pretty profitable and successful, and uh, and uh, I'm, I really I'm just going to show you a movie. I had um, some uh, some students, some UCSB students this summer, uh, the Blue Horizons group. They came out and followed me around for a couple of weeks, 
and they, they produced this exceptional movie. And uh, instead of me talking, I'm just going to show the movie. It's, it's very self-explanatory, and it's a good, in-depth, sort of personal perspective on myself and what I go through. I was a commercial diver at Ecomar, who was a company that harvested mussels off of oil platforms in Southern California. I did that for a couple of years and then I wanted to continue my education and I went off to University of Ireland and I studied there for a year uh, for my master's degree in fisheries management, development, and conservation. I came back to um, Santa Barbara and the community said, we need some local, where are the local mussels? Uh, and they started asking me if I could uh, start producing the local mussels. I found this woman who knew how to spawn mussels and uh, we gave it a try. We put mussels on rope and uh, we put them in the, in, on the lease and they grew exceptionally well. Most shellfish production happens in backwater environments, intertidal environments, in bays and estuaries. But by growing them out in the ocean with a high flow, a lot of those situations are alleviated. Okay, so this is the deep, deep, deep ocean. In relation to the long line, it's not very deep at all. And so here is 80 feet of water depth and then you have a 700 foot long line. You saw these four surface floats and that's what's holding up this long line that sits 20 feet below the surface. And then the ropes are hanging below that uh, about 10 feet. For me it's a very creative process because you have this blank piece of ocean and you really have to think of a way, well, how am I gonna do this? And so you're constantly changing the way you think and do things all the time, you know, depending on the set of conditions that you have. Nothing has to be the way it is. Community Seafood is a boat to table kind of program. They're generally known as community supported fishery programs where um, you have a group of fishermen, however large, 30 to 40 guys who all work with one person to bring in the catch and then that person connects them with their larger community. Having Bernard as one of our fishermen to provide fresh, incredibly sustainable product is really amazing. It's not only that Bernard provides an incredible product, um, both black mussels and he used to do Pacific oysters, which were incredible, um, but it's also that he's the only local guy doing it. Bernard's been a real innovator in terms of developing local techniques for food production in our coastal ocean. And there are a lot of places around the world where we've done a lot of coastal aquaculture, but California has not been a leader in in, in that area and Bernard's been kind of a real trendsetter here locally in showing that there are ways to produce a really great seafood product in a way that has low environmental impacts on the coastal ocean. We are bringing in 90% of our seafood comes from everywhere else and we're not keeping up with our demand. And so obviously at some point something's going to give and we're going to need to produce more seafood. If we look out into the future in terms of the demand for food, we see a huge increase in the demand for animal protein over the next 35 years or so. 
and it comes from two things. One is more people. We're going to go up to somewhat over 9 billion people in that time frame. And the other is growth and wealth of people, particularly in the developing world. Those two things in combination mean that we project about an 80% increase in the global demand for animal protein by 2050. That is a whopping increase in demand for food. <laughs> Far and away, if you're talking uh, efficiency-wise, if you're talking about the ability to create a sustainable protein, fish is it. There's just no contest. When you talk about water consumption, when you talk about energy, when you talk about fuel consumption, transportation costs, you can't get a more efficient source of protein and a healthier version than seafood. So that um, really needs to become a priority of the American diet, and right now it's not. He's on the boat now three days a week, and then in the fall it'll be every day, or almost every day. He never has a free moment, really. I mean, on the weekend, he has to force himself to take some time, you know, away. Riding instructor, she's yelling at him, right? I used to help him on the boat a lot, on his old boat, which was pretty funny. Um, sometimes he had, would have to do dives, more just as like a safety person, because it's 90 feet to be down there. My kids, like Nico, were saying these really big words at a really young age. They're just verbal, these two are verbal. Girl, you don't want to eat a muscle? No. My nose muscle. <laughs> you know, even from day one, he's been really optimistic and um, and positive and determined that this is going to work, and um, and that's how he's gotten as far as he's gotten. One of the important things to know, first of all, is that this farm is the only open ocean farm in all of California, so this is it. And uh, the reason why it is so is because the regulations are extremely complex. It's very hard for anyone to figure out. I myself have not figured it out. There's a whole bureaucracy of government agencies that anyone operating the ocean has to go through, such as the Coast Commission, the Department of Public Health, the Regional Water Quality Board, U.S. Army Corps of Engineering, uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife, I have to contact the Coast Guard. For a farmer like myself to do that is, is overwhelming. That's the challenge for me, uh, is to get completely legitimate. And even though I thought I was legitimate, it turns out I'm not. Even though I have permits from 1986, basically uh, those permits are invalid. So I'm getting basically completely all new, modern day 2014 permits. So in 2006, the state legislature passed a new law called the Sustainable Oceans Act, which regulates aquaculture and state waters. If there's a project that predated this law, then they already have some permits and they're already operating. And so if they wanted to you know, modify or expand their operation, then they may have to do some additional environmental assessment. It's just really, really so sad that we thought everything was great and we had it all in order and then just, you know, your business is going well and you're finally like, feel like you're getting, like, making something out of it, and then you find out, oh, you don't have the right permit, you know? Um, yeah, it's devastating. 
and it would be devastating to think if, if this was all for naught. My argument with a lot of these government agencies that want to charge me a fortune to do all these studies is that it's forcing me to spend a ton of money to get my permits and it's forcing the issue that in order to recoup my investment I'm really going to have to get out there and get my 72 acres under production. And there are a lot of potential impacts for putting a farm out in the middle of the ocean. Um, first of all, it depends on what kind of fish you're farming. You've got parasites and disease that could be transmitted into the ocean. And so a lot of water pollution concerns, a lot of concerns about habitat disruption, um, a lot of potential impacts. You grow in an area that has very little economic value and also very little ecological value. I mean, it's over a sand bottom. It's in a place that nobody else really uses to fish for other seafood. It's an environment that is not sensitive at all. We've dumped a lot of nutrients. We've fertilized the coastal ocean in a very big way. And in some cases, this has led to really big increases in the bloom of plankton that can have lots of negative impacts, including if it gets too big of a bloom, you can actually develop dead zones. When we grow mussels in the ocean, they're feeding off of plankton and tridal materials that are in the water and so to the extent that you can grow mussels in places where we've artificially increased the blooms of plankton we actually may be providing an environmental benefit by reducing those plankton levels back down to a level that would be more appropriate for that particular habitat. If you talk to most people on the street there's a lot of um, concern about environmental impacts of aquaculture and and this is one of those things where um, oftentimes, public discussion, I think, of, of problems like this are not uh, well informed about the whole scope of the problem. And so this is one where, for some reason, the environmental impacts of aquaculture have, got, have had a lot of public attention, um, yet they're not put in, the, in a level playing field analysis where we look at what are those impacts compared to the comparable impacts from other forms of meat production. I think we're coming to a new age of um, food consciousness and I think that people are realizing that when you get food directly from the source, whether it be your farmer, your fisherman, your rancher, you're going to get a higher quality product um, and it's going to be a more efficient choice and more environmentally friendly choice. So if at all possible, locate your farm. It's not that hard in California. It's very easy to eat local and it's a definitely much better choice not only for yourself as an individual but also for your community and the environment around you. Harvested yesterday, 24 hours old, grown with love. I uh, have been coming to the Santa Barbara Farmer's Market for a number of years, and uh, I tried Bernard's mussels being grown locally. I could taste the ocean, the freshness, the crispness. Uh, they're just a wonderful, uh, sustainable shellfish to eat that it doesn't get any better than being in Santa Barbara here. Are you folks need some mussels? You need some oysters? All right. There we go. Come on over here. I'll give you a private showing. So you're going to be around next week? Yeah? Okay. And you can try it out. You tell me how you like it. Come back next week. We'll have a cigarette. We'll talk it over. Okay? We won't smoke. That's an expression from a movie. So very good. Very tasty. I became a shellfish farmer and a parent. Uh, I have two kids. What I take home with my kids and what go happens out there, it's the same thing. You know, it's just like I spend an amazing day out there, and then I come home and I spend an amazing day just, just 
discovering what my children are all about and, and watching and learning and having fun with them and you know all kinds of crap happens at the same time and, you know and you just work through that you know so you know as a parent you know we always try to parent through our own eyes and our own ideas but the reality is you really just need to listen to your children better and discover what who they are and what they are all about right as a parent and that's what you do that's what I do as a shellfish farmer I, I try to listen to what the ocean is telling me what what the, what the mussels are doing out there and and I try to discover what the actual farming is all about and, and not to have a preconceived notion of what it is but more of what it isn't and what it could be and that's that's like what that's what parenting is all about that's what becoming a shellfish farmer is all about just just getting out there having children putting a shellfish farm out there and just discovering you know the sort of miracle of life you know what's going on out there it's, it's amazing you leave them all to go to go find yourself oh can bring them along it's too far far from what he knows Ooh. run run you fall Should you fall far, far from it all? Ho, ho. Run. And so, right now, I want to bring up uh, Ron Skinner. Ron is the education manager uh, uh, for the Santa Barbara Natural History Museum, and he is uh, going to talk to you about the Santa Barbara Sustainable Seafood Coalition. Thank you. I know you're all very anxious to have your taste of abalone, so I'll try to keep this short and sweet. Um, coming in 2015 is an exciting new program. For years now, the Maritime Museum has offered their tastings in October, and the Museum of Natural History Sea Center has also been offering a seafood tasting in the month of October. We have decided in 2015 to come together, join forces, and include some other organizations in town and form a coalition to start looking at sustainable seafood um, locally, the sustainability of our fisheries and try to educate the local um, community uh, about these resources and what the seasonality of our local fish is and, and try to swing, lo swing demand uh, to local seafood. And so in 2015, the Museum of Natural History is going to come together with the Maritime Museum, the Commercial Fishermen of Santa Barbara, the Community Environmental Council, and UC Santa Barbara, and perhaps even some other organizations. And we are going to start a two-fold two program where we're going to start these tasting events instead of concentrating them all in October and, and kind of competing against each other, we're going to start distributing them throughout the year and celebrating our local seafood, uh, sometimes during season openers, sometimes just you know, to celebrate our, our aquaculturists. Um, in addition, we're also going to offer some educational programs where we'll look at the sustainability of our fisheries, try to educate people about them, try to give the stakeholders in the local seafood chain tools that they can use to take the sustainability of our local resources to the next level. And we're very excited about this program. You know, the, the Channel Islands I often hear referred to as the Galapagos of the Northern Hemisphere. I prefer to think of the Galapagos as the Channel Islands of the Southern Hemisphere. <laughs> and we are, we are at the doorstep of an amazing resource here. And there are a lot of people in, in this room and working out of this harbor and working in this community to try to very sustainably manage those resources and preserve them for our future generations in this community. And we're, we're all very excited to be a part of this. Um, so look forward to some more tasting events distributed throughout 2015. 
and we invite you to come and learn a, bit, learn a little bit about our local lobster. It is very sustainably managed that we can do something to improve the sustainability of the fishery though. Right now, 98% of California spiny lobster lo harvested locally get shipped to China. And that's not too sustainable. So what we want to do as a community is improve that sustainability, and there's one way to do it, and that is to start eating local lobster. So I invite you all to come, discover how delicious lobster is, discover where you can find it, how to prepare it, and, and please take part in improving the sustainability of our community and look forward to our programs coming in 2015. Thank you. So we have one more speaker, then we're going to bring our chefs up to very quickly to talk about uh, their tastings. But I want to bring up Carol Blanchett. She is the research biologist at the Marine Science Institute. Carol? So I just wanted to start off saying I know that um, you know I'm, I'm going to be talking about some aspects of ocean change tonight, and this is some of the research that we're doing in our lab, but certainly nobody knows more about what's going on in the ocean than people like Doug and Bernard. And I just want to say that we really, um, one of the reasons I got involved in becoming a marine biologist because my grandfather was a fisherman, and I feel like that's kind of the message I want to bring across tonight is that... Um, you know, what we're doing can hopefully really inform um, the future of continuing this as a very sustainable fishery and a sustainable economy. Okay, question. What do all these species have in common? Shellfish. All right. So if you got that right, you get to eat tonight. Um, organisms with shells. And the reason um, I brought this up is because that's the theme of tonight, and it really relates to some of the work that we're doing at UCSB in our lab. And I know many of you have probably heard about ocean acidification, so I'm, I'll go through this a little bit quickly because I know we all want to eat. But um, I'd like to, you know, when I bring up this topic, it has a tendency to, to um, be a little depressing, um, thinking about climate change and all these negative impacts. So I promise you I will try to end on a positive note. So what is ocean acidification? Um, it's basically um, a change in the seawater chemistry that can definitely have a very large impact on species like shellfish that have shells. And the reason why is because all of those species form their shells out of calcium carbonate, and that's very dependent upon chemistry. So uh, this is probably one of the most famous uh, data slides now in the world. This is called the Keeling Curve. And what it represents is basically the increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere through time. And this was made um, in Mauna Loa in Hawaii. That's a, um, a place that's really far away from a lot of industrial sources of pollution. And what we see is that from 1960 to the present time, it's been steadily increasing through time. And that increase in carbon dioxide is related to um, that partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the seawater as well. And so you, if you have one of these machines like a soda stream or you drink bubbly water, it's the same sort of idea. That carbon dioxide is um, absorbed by the seawater. And the result of that really is that um, that carbon dioxide is going into the seawater. It is um, doing a very big benefit in terms of the temperature of the earth. It's really protecting the planet from becoming a lot warmer because a lot of that carbon dioxide that would make the planet warmer is now being drawn away by the ocean. So that's a really good thing. But there's a big cost to that that we've just realized um, in the recent couple of decades. And the cost to that is that um, as that CO2 becomes absorbed by the ocean, um, the ocean becomes more acidic. So it really changes the chemistry of the seawater. And that increased acidity of the seawater due to that absorption of carbon dioxide is what people commonly refer to as ocean acidification. And I'm not going to go through all the chemistry, but essentially what happens is it impedes um, the ability of calcifying marine organisms to form a shell because it, um, it lowers the um, the ions that are available to them to build their structural elements of their shell by changing the seawater chemistry. So 
essentially it makes it difficult for them to build a shell. And this just shows you a representation of um, a very small marine snail that's been exposed to um, acidic seawater over time and you can see that shell dissolving through time. And this has been uh, really well documented in a couple of marine species. So I don't know if you've ever heard of pteropods. They're extremely cute little um, marine snails. They call them the butterflies or the potato chips of the sea because they're really the base of the food chain. So if you eat salmon, if you eat a lot of um, large fish, they eat these critters. And they have shells. And they're also really sensitive to ocean acidification. And this has been really well documented recently in the wild that these animals are literally dissolving. Um, which obviously, you know, is going to have impacts at the higher trophic levels. Um, many of you have probably heard of this one, this example of the Pacific oyster. Um, these are, uh, there are a couple of large oyster hatcheries in the Pacific Northwest in Washington and Oregon. And in Washington and Oregon, um, the water that comes ashore is, is uh, from highly, um, cold upwelled water and that water also contains a lot of CO2 from the residents time in the ocean so that water tends to be a little bit more acidic and the oyster growers first started noticing a major mortality of their young oysters um, and could not figure out what this mortality was due to and over time they realized that the mortality of these oysters so these oysters um, they don't feed and they have to form their shells really rapidly and they can't do that really rapidly when the when the seawater becomes too acidic and they basically just die and this has resulted in a huge hit to the economies of these states um, one of the hatcheries actually moved to hawaii to get away from that and um, the 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 bright note about this that I, I will kind of bring up a little bit later too is that one of the ways now that we know what's going on and we have the tools to monitor ocean ph um, uh, the the growers have really developed some clever strategies to get around this one is that they can actually predict when these upwelling waters are coming and they can close off that incoming water to protect their larvae um, another is that they can actually buffer the seawater to change the chemistry okay so what's what's really happening in the wild what what is the current ph actually like and I'm just going to give you three examples here. Um, these are three different places that the researchers in our group work. And um, actually, I will note that right now they are on a large, um, what is it called? A, a, one of those large planes that goes to Antarctica, C-140. Does that sound right? C-130. So they're in the air right now. I just saw um, a post from them yesterday. So they're flying to Antarctica. And we have one of these instruments called the CFET, which measures ocean pH, that's been left in Antarctica for the entire winter. So it'll be really interesting to collect those data. Um, we also have a, um, a group of people that work in Marea, French Polynesia. Awfully nice place. Um, I've never been there. I tend to hold down the fort in Santa Barbara. Um, and these show you the very sort of typical patterns that we see. Antarctica, the pH is relatively stable. It's a relatively um, less dynamic ocean environment. It's cold and it hovers around eight. Morea French Polynesia, it's a coral reef. And what you see is a very clear daily cycle in Morea. And that's driven largely by the um, biological processes on the reef. So there's photosynthesis during the day and respiration at night. Santa Barbara is a different story. What we have in Santa Barbara is we're, um, we have a much more dynamic environment. We have an upwelling ecosystem. And so we see a lot of flushing, a lot of movement inshore and offshore. And we see um, rapid changes in pH uh, through time. And that variability, it turns out, is really important. So the big question is how, you know, assuming this acidification increases through time, how are these organisms going to respond to that over time? And um, I don't have time to go through all of our data, and you probably don't want me to. So I'm just going to summarize the three bullet points here of what we've been finding. The first is that that variability, the variability in the ocean conditions, um, may actually be beneficial to some organisms to help them adapt to a changing climate because they're used to seeing these big swings in pH. That has actually primed their genes to be able to adapt 
Um, we also see that some organisms, um, one of the ones we've studied here is the purple sea urchins, seem to have the capacity for really rapid evolution in the face of OA. So we've actually measured genetic change in these, in these organisms in experimental treatments. And then the, the final one is that that standing uh, genetic variation in the population we think could be this reservoir of resilience to climate change. And so this is sort of the positive note I'm going to try to end on and how that plays into some conservation strategies. Um, so how do we manage for OA? We can't control ocean acidification. It's going to happen and it's going to continue to happen if we stop all driving our cars tomorrow because there's this reservoir of carbon dioxide that's already in the ocean. Um, so obviously it's really about the rate at which the change is happening and that's it's really this rate of change that's going to most strongly affect the capacity of these populations to respond. So the two things we can do um, are you know, obviously the first one is reduce our emissions, right? We just get less carbon dioxide out there over time that will cycle out of the system and we can lower that potential for the ocean to acidify. In the meantime, um, the one other strategy that I'm gonna, gonna talk about here um, on my final note relates to what I just talked about. That standing pool of genetic variability we're finding is really important in terms of the potential for these organisms to adapt. So how do we conserve that evolutionary potential? Um, one of the things I'm going to bring up has been a really controversial topic if you've lived in Santa Barbara for some time, which are marine protected areas. And a lot of the debate around marine protected areas has really um, gone around this idea of do they improve fisheries. And um, there's really one other way that marine protected areas can work and that marine protected areas can conserve this evolutionary potential. Clearly, there are areas in the ocean that are fished. These marine protected areas are not fished. And what we're finding is that that genetic diversity that's left over in these places may provide that pool of resilience for these organisms to adapt. So that was sort of my, my note of hope. And then the last thing I'm going to end on is just this, um, this idea of this collaborative relationship. So there's this group called the California Current Acidification Network. This is a website. It's full of all kinds of data and resources, and this really represents a true partnership between scientists at many universities, um, fishermen, growers, people that are all really searching to solve a very similar problem. And so I think that that's something that I, I really um, value in sort of being able to come here and exchange ideas with Bernard and Doug and talk about these kinds of things is that we're, we're all really trying to do very similar things and having these partnerships and continuing the kinds of monitoring that we do um, hopefully is, is a benefit um, in the future for everybody. So. That's it. So um, now I'd like to bring up both um, uh, James Sly and Michael Hutchings to tell you a little bit about what they have prepared. Uh, James Sly, of course, Sly's Restaurant and Carpinteria. Uh, he actually uses fresh seafood and, and wonderful preparations, and of course, Michael's catering. And I also want to mention when you go to your tastings at Michael's table, we also have pastries from Christine Dahl Pastries, so enjoy those as well. So Chef James, Chef Michael. Uh, I want to thank uh, Doug. He did donate all the abalone for this event, and it's, uh, it's a labor of love that he does, and we're happy to cook his product. In fact, I've been cooking cultured abalone since 1981. And I'll tell you a quick story how I, that came about. I was working, if you've been in town here, you'll remember this, the old Olive Mill Bistro with uh, Paul and uh, Rick Hammond, who uh, was a restaurateur way back to the Somerset days. And I had recently started there like in July, and in like September, this guy came in the kitchen, he had this bag with him, and he said, you know, I'm a, I grow abalone. I wanted to see if you could use these. And I knew abalone because James and I worked together back in 1974 at a place called a shakery, and we cooked abalone. It was the big white steaks. Big steaks. Yeah, and you cooked it in one of a couple ways, huh? Yeah. With almonds or with cucumbers. <laughs> And so I knew about abalone. You know, we didn't have to process it, it was ready. But um, these little abalone, they were what, uh, what I now call cocktail abalone. They were about an inch and a half in diameter, live in the shell. And I knew you had to pound them. And I knew you had to shell them first before you pounded them. <laughs> so I, I shucked a few, put them on the cutting board, and gave it a whack with a mallet. 
and it went for a trip. <laughs> <laughs> Bing! Right across the kitchen. So I figured you got to do something else. I put them on a towel, covered it, and, and hit it with the mallet, and, and that worked. And I started selling those in a way that I now call comme chez soi, which is like my way, our, the ho- way of the house. And it uh, was done with the, uh, the mother sauce of the time called beurre blanc, to which I added fresh dill, chopped tomatoes, enoki doki mushrooms, and golden caviar from the whitefish. And it took off like crazy. We were soon selling up to 80 to 100 dozen a week of these little abalone. I had bushels and bushels and bushels of shells uh, after about six months. And some years later, um, this was a, a place from a place called Ab Lab. John McMullen, who was uh, one of the early pioneers, uh, he said, well, you know, you kept us alive for a long time because their original mission was to grow these out to a, like a little spat size, like a fingernail size, and give them to the fishing game to restock the rapidly depleting wild stocks, which uh, I guess it didn't work because in 1990, 91, they shut down the fishery. But I've been using them ever since. It's been a great product. I'm always pleased to serve it. I've served it all the way from New York for an event once to Hearst Castle recently uh, for a, a big gala there. And it's, a, I think, a tremendous product, and I'm delighted that it's available constantly. I have come up, maybe I'm a lazy chef these days, but I come on a very easy way of doing it. I, I do it like what I call escargot style. So I make a, a, a garlic butter, like an escargot butter, pound it, put it back in a shell, top it with this butter, and then just bake it from a raw state to a cooked state, and it takes about six, eight minutes. And if you can sniff it a little, you probably smell the garlic butter over there starting to sizzle. So that's what we, we'll be serving tonight. Uh, we have plenty, so uh, we'll look forward to you, having you enjoy this great local product. Thank you. Howdy. Well, we serve abalone at Slides, but tonight we're going to be doing oysters. And these are from Grassy Bar in Morro Bay probably the most popular of the oysters we sell at the restaurant and we typically sell three or four bushels so close to 500 a week Uh, very popular tonight we're doing them rockefeller style tired old favorite so with uh, spinach and green onions and tarragon and a butter and then a a fish velouté and holiday sauce on top Um, i think you'll enjoy them so thanks i have to mention that michael Hutchings was the person who came up with the idea for Maritime Tastings, and we wouldn't have done this without him, and and he has been so key in helping this happen. And James has been with the Maritime Museum for a lot of our events, our Harbor Tastings and Treasures event in March, and and these Maritime Tastings all three years. So thank you, thank you, thank you to them. Thank you to everybody, that uh, all of our folks who have supplied food and wine tonight. Uh, David, who is here pouring for Jaffer's wine, uh, poured very heavy and poured all his wine while we were out on the patios. So Tom, uh, Deep Sea Winery is over here. Uh, Michael uh, and Christine Dahl, pastries over there. James is in the, the back there. We have uh, olives from Olivos Del Mar and some bread from uh, D'Angelo's Bakery. And then uh, Chuck's Waterfront Grill in the summer and mussels right over here. Again, Bernard and um, uh, um, Doug and Carol and uh, Ron are here and I'm here. If you have any questions about anything you learned tonight, Thank you very much for being here, for putting up with the, uh, the rough beginning here tonight. I hope you enjoy the food and wine.